Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Stephen Spector. With me is uh, Rob Hirschfeld, uh, as usual. Hey, Rob, how are you? Hey, Stephen. Good to talk to you. So today's guest is, uh, we're really, really excited to have uh, Dave McCrory here, who is the, um, I love this title, VP of Engineering for Machine Learning at GE Digital. And uh, I have title envy, if there's such a thing. So, uh, Dave, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Rob. Uh, great to get to join you both. So, I think we're going to start. We had a uh, podcast a few weeks ago with uh, Keith Townsend, the CTO advisor, and him and Rob had a discussion about um, data gravity. And I think uh, I think it's possible that we didn't quite understand the point. And so I know in that podcast, Rob said, oh, we better get Dave on to, to clear this up. So why don't we kick off and start there and then uh, see where our discussion goes. Sounds great to me. Um, I think it'd be great to kind of uh, maybe have Rob cover a little bit uh, of the backstory since, it's, uh, since it will have been a while since both the listeners and myself have, have heard the podcast. Sure. A, a little recap is useful. Um, but definitely good. That was a great podcast. So, so people should uh, you know, listen to this one and then go back to that one. Don't pause. Uh, <laughs> so basically, Keith and I covered a lot of topics, but uh, one of our favorite topics on the latest Shiny is edge and edge infrastructure. And, and we, were, we were sort of working through this process of where compute has to happen in the cloud or in the edge, or some people have been talking about core as this sort of three-tier model and processing moving back and forth and that the data is being generated at the edge, but there's also some data in the cloud because of, you know, maybe your profiles are there. There's some, some correlation data that has to occur. Um, and we ended up with this sort of confusing mess of, wait a second, there's data in one place that has to get to another place. There's processing that it's getting all floated around. Some of it you're going to do close to the data because that's where the data is. Um, and then Keith sort of, you know, threw out the data gravity uh, concept, right? You know, it's the, you know, the data pulls, pulls the compute towards it. Um, we can go through some history in a little bit later, but that, that, was, that was sort of where things got messy. Um, this idea that, that data pulls compute towards it or pulls infrastructure towards it. And that's where I said, ah, wait a second. We need to pull in the, the pull in the data gravity expert, put us in the right orbit to talk about these things. So, is that a good tee up? Is that a fair uh, reflection, Dave? I, I think so. Uh, I think it was great. Uh, wonderful summary. I, I can tell you um, with the the work that uh, that I'm doing now, we've been dealing and having to begin to spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, all of the implications, uh, both at the edge, along with in the data center, um, the the amount of data generated at the edge simply becomes so great uh, that there are no reasonable network connections on the planet that could simply shuttle all of that data back to uh, a a centralized data center, whether it be uh, a cloud or not. And so you end up with problems of uh, data being generated at the edge it, to very high degrees. Uh, there's a there's a particular uh, division of GE that um, uh, that has a project that we've been looking at that generates on the order of uh, 600 petabytes of data uh, per year. Um, that's every year. Um, on site and uh, they end up having to throw the majority of that data away, even though it would be incredibly valuable to keep. Uh, and the reason is there's simply no place to store that data. Um, and today, uh, no subset of that data is really stored either. Um, it's stored for... So, uh, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you for a second. Um, and at some point, we'd love to dive right into the deep. Uh, we're, we'll, I'll, we'll have to pull you back out to have you explain more what you're doing with GE and, and, and the source of your, 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 your knowledge on this. But before that, um, you're talking about volumes of data, sheer bandwidth. 
most of our conversations talk about latency, latency, latency. I, how much of this, where, where's the balance in what you're talking about? Well, so or, that's or, or are we wrong to chase latency? Um, so latency is only a single element. Uh, so there's, uh, there's throughput and latency that are both involved in kind of the, uh, the equation of what causes uh, data gravity. Um, the attractiveness of low latency is one of the two advantages and the other is uh, throughput or overall bandwidth if you think of it that way. So I can get low latency by being close to something um, and or I can get high, uh, high bandwidth. And so thinking purely in terms of latency isn't always the best approach because you can very much end up with a situation where it's... Uh, it's still kind of high latency, but the bandwidth uh, problem is still uh, so large that you really don't have an alternative. Um, so you can think of it as, uh, it, for those that aren't familiar with how the latency versus bandwidth, you can think of it as latency being the, uh, the speed limit of the highway. So how fast uh, a, a, a vehicle is allowed to go down that highway. Um, you can imagine in the latency, though, that highway could be a single lane. Um, so you could have a very, very, very fast lane, but you can only have one lane. And you can think of bandwidth as being the number of lanes on the highway. So how many things can you, uh, how many lanes can you have? And those lanes might have uh, overall a, a lower speed limit, but if you have more lanes, over time, you could still transfer a greater amount of vehicles or data or whatever we're talking about. Okay. So we, we, used to, we used to talk about the bandwidth of flying hard drives between the coasts is much higher than any other way to transport the data, but the latency sucks. That's that's part right. of, that, was, that was the analogy we used to use uh, back, back in the day. It's true, it, but it boils down to what, what your needs are. And so if you're dealing with uh, with use cases um, out at the edge where it's purely a latency thing, um, then you're going to have to deal with it on the edge based on the latency requirements. What I'm, what I'm saying is that is one common, um, but even if you're able to eliminate latency requirements, you can still be overrun with uh, overall bandwidth uh, requirements. So you could have a super fast, low latency connection, but you may not have enough bandwidth anyway. And, and both of those are gonna have the effect of creating gravity around the, the data, right? Is that a fair? That's right. That, that's, that's exactly right. That's the way data gravity is defined is the closer you are to this source of data, um, there is some combination of lower latency and or um, higher bandwidth. And so you may get both out of being closer to the data, or you may get only one or the other, but that's the reason why you're attracted to, to be closer to the data to begin with, is that, at, is that advantage. And, and parenthetically for listeners, Dave actually has equations and had done some really interesting work trying to actually provide some mathematics behind this. Um, I'm not, this isn't the place to go into the details for that, but there's, there's actually science uh, which is what I love about how this how this has progressed. People throw out data gravity as this uh, generic thing, and Dave's very concrete about it in in conversation. So um, I'm, I'm, I'll add that as a bookmark for somebody who wants to go do some research and dig in. But um, so, boy, I, we can go deeper in sort of thinking this through. Look, you want to talk a little bit about what your day job is and some of the the, the things that you think about for that. Um, and then we can, that'll, that'll take us back into some practical implications on, on data gravity at the edge and, and where to put compute and, and more importantly, where things are going. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so my day job, uh, as was mentioned, I'm the VP of engineering for uh, the machine learning group at GE Digital. That machine learning group is called uh, WISE uh, IO. They were uh, formerly, before I joined the team, were a company that was acquired by uh, GE Digital. Uh, and WiseIO has been doing machine learning in production for uh, many years, which makes them kind of uh, uh, special in and of that very thing. Um, so 
my day job consists of managing the engineering team, which really wraps around um, dealing with uh, data sources, getting the data to a point where it's ready to be labeled and to uh, train specific models along with um, then post uh, post models being created and generating predictions. How do you tie those predictions back into uh, production and applications, databases and, and other components? Uh, all of those things and the kind of overall um, uh, structure is all done by my team. And we have a separate team that specializes in the modeling itself. And they spend time with the, uh, what I would call domain experts of whatever the domain happens to be, whether it be aviation or uh, say healthcare or uh, power or any one of the other divisions inside of GE. Um, they work with those domain experts to uh, to figure out and program uh, uh, the best algorithms and or models, machine learning models, uh, to do these predictions and such. And uh, we have several of them running in production today. So this, this brings up something that I think is really important for Edge, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around, which is the balance between training and and actually using the algorithms uh, in the field. Because, right, we're, we, there's this interesting match where you, you generate a whole bunch of data, you need to train the models based on real data to, to build an algorithm. But once that algorithm rhythm's built, it, it doesn't, it's not that computationally expensive, and this, I guess this is the point, to maintain, to actually use the model, right? Is that, so there's sort of, a whole bunch of data goes into the model, but the model itself is not is not going to require a warehouse of computers to to execute. That 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 is correct. Um, once you once you've built a machine learning model, um, you can very much uh, just continue to run that model without having to uh, store all of the existing data that you applied to that model, assuming that you don't want to try and recreate that model from scratch for whatever purposes. So from so are we in a place where we don't need a lot of computation at the edge to be like training models where we can basically take the data, you know, slower latency, move it into a into a place, right? We have to figure out a way to get it off of the edge, train the models, validate the models, and then basically we're pushing tiny bits of, of model data back. Is that is that is there sort of this big flow and then small small models coming back how's how's that balance the, or is that not really a, a thing is that not really a the way it's going to work um i see that being the way it works in the majority of use okay. cases um the uh if you look at what uh for example amazon announced with deep lens uh the deep lens uh, technology which for those that aren't familiar it's a camera with a powerful processor, a video camera with a powerful processor that has a, uh, the ability to store a machine learning model and do uh, object recognition in real time based on a model that you program. Um, the model is actually built and programmed uh, in the cloud and the model is then pushed down in a format down to the camera so that it can do the object recognition, object detection. Um, that is a common uh, format for what I believe we will do with machine learning on the edge. It is not perfect, um, but it's pretty effective. Uh, the challenge is when you run into wanting to send, uh, send the model that's in the cloud a massive amount of data uh, and try and program it, and it's simply not practical to do it, which would be more along the lines of what I was talking about, where you're creating, say, 600 petabytes of data or more uh, at a go it doesn't become very efficient to send that up to a cloud for processing um, unless right. you had some kind of magical, uh, uh, incredibly high bandwidth connection. Um, so does that does that create a need for what people are calling core data centers where you've got some metro area, you know, machine learning training facility where you can ingress this data? Um, 
And then we end up uh, with three tiers of infrastructure. I, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for this because there's a part of that that feels very wrong to me. But there's there's some advocates for it. and I'm, I'm, I don't know. What's, what's your take? Uh, so my take is that um, you're going to have multiple, you're going to have multiple approaches. I don't think you're going to have, uh, I don't think you're going to have a incredibly large number of kind of tiers. Um, I think you'll have data processing that happens on site to build models where it's simply not feasible or practical to, uh, to do model building outside of the facility or location. I think that will be yeah. common. And then I think the most common thing will be uh, training, uh, training models based on data sets that are put up into the cloud. And, and the models don't have to be trained in real time. They simply have to do predictions in real time. Um, so. so that would be more common things that everybody's dealing with, like facial recognition or speech recognition or uh, text recognition. You know, sometimes the stuff that's sort of like, all right, everybody's doing this, we can optimize for it. But if you're at a factory and you're trying to analyze the parts coming off of the line at the factory, that model training is not is not generalizable training. It's it's for that that one site. Is that a fair? No, uh, at least no, okay. it, it, it would be more of it would be more specific to um, external factors. So external factors could be things like, um, uh, let's say you're manufacturing um, a specific type of device or component and uh, you don't allow any of your data to go off of site for, um, for a number of reasons. It could be that you do, let's say you do a government contract and you're not allowed for anything to leave the premises, including data uh, regarding this. It could be um, uh, it could be trade considered trade secret. It could also be governmental. Um, there are numerous reasons where it wouldn't be allowed to leave, um, in addition to perhaps being just too large a data set. But I think in many cases on the average factory floor, uh, what would happen is you would actually send the data up to a central, I'm going to call it a cloud, but a central location. Um, where you would do model training or you would have a group of domain experts that would assist in training a model. The model would then be distributed out to whatever the uh, identification detection system is that's doing the analysis um, out on each of the factory floors. A lot of these cases, at least today in the industrial use cases, um, if I identify um, problems with a specific kind of part or something else, uh, it would be applicable to a large number of, uh, say, manufacturing facilities globally. That makes sense. But how, so what's the half-life on a model? I, I mean, because I could see, you know, some models are going to be pretty, pretty long-term, but some of them might, you, you know, you're going to be constantly adding new data or more factors or refining, I, I would assume. Is sure, there a half-life on a model? Yeah. Uh, it depends on the application uh, that's being performed and how refined the model already is and can you find improvements in uh, in the model. And if the answer is that the data is not updated very often and the model is very good already, um, the model's half-life uh, may be quite long. Uh, if the model is still in the early days or the data is very fast changing or you're constantly adding, say, new parts or new things that you want to identify or something like that, the model may have a very short half-life and you may be sending model updates, um, you know, quarterly, monthly, weekly. Um, it, it, it would depend on the application. In some cases, uh, you're not allowed to update the model even if you want to. Um, so okay. there are- Like a, like there a regulatory are, pharmaceutical, correct. hospital, medical type thing. That's right. Anything that falls under regulatory, you updating models becomes harder. Uh, and, and and that makes me think through, I, you know, we're, we're sort of talking as if we're going to apply a model and then throw out the data. But I can see cases where some of this data, you know, even though we're generating huge volumes of it, only acting on, a, you know, a tiny amount or filtering it through, you still keep the, the raw data or you still want to. Like, so I heard an analogy of somebody, you know, a plane is an edge infrastructure 
and when the plane comes in, you know, into uh, the Skyport, it's it's it's. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm saying docked, but it's not. The word isn't docked. Um, but they they actually hook up an Ethernet cable or a fiber cable and 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 dump all the data from that flight on into you know into the database that's on site. Um, you know, they cruise ships are having similar that's, things. Yeah, they they do that. That is accurate. Um, it's it's quite a large volume of data. Um, and uh, they basically it's all of the it's all of the sensors from from the plane. It's a giant dump of all of that data. There are things that happen in flight that happen in real time that are sent. Um, right. And then it's everything else is then downloaded when the plane lands and it uh, and it's there either being swapped or reloaded or what have you. Part of that process is a, is a data dump of all the data from that from that completed flight. Um, all of that data um, is data that you're required to keep. Um, you can't just get rid of it and you don't want to get rid of it anyway. Um, it's going to give you, uh, it's going to give you insight into a whole lot of things. Uh, the, it, so there are challenges around it, but it does have value, including even if you've already created a model, um, keeping that data has value in building a future models and such. That makes sense, and and also we're going to bring in additional data, additional sensors, right? That that's where I think of the model. It's like, all right, we have an airplane flying through the air, and it has models for the engines that are saying, here's the maintenance model, you know, on the engines. But we might figure out, all right, we actually are now collecting additional data about you know temperature zones or smog or solar flares or something that wasn't in the model before that we can now go and analyze, and you're going to come back and continually add, increment, add on. Um, right, video cameras of passengers standing up or down, changing the dynamics of, I don't know, some, it's not hard to imagine some of these, especially visual, you know, video feeds feeding into sensor data um, in really interesting ways. Well, sure, you could have sensor fusion, which is really what you're describing, okay. affecting how you want to featureize a, a model, which is, which is really adding those elements, it's called featureization. Um, and so, Yes, you could have that kind of evolution of a model. You could have that uh, that the actual al the backing algorithms of the model change. So you might change the structure of the model itself. Um, if you think of uh, of classic neural networks, you might add more hidden layers, just to simplify it. But to add those hidden layers, you can't take the previous model the way it is in any of the formats that they that currently exist for machine learning models and just magically turn that into a new model you have to replay uh, the relevant data back through that model for training purposes well so edge is edge is much more fluid of a thing because of the data gravity here right and some of it's not active data gravity i, I mean i'm in, do you have a concept in the in the data gravity models for this sort of offline data that you might then archive or move or reuse or put into a different whole different facility that has different value when it's at, at rest? Well, so the, you just hit on kind of the key point, which is there's kind of um, you can think of it as uh, I was having a conversation with uh, James Urquhart a while back about this. They're really uh, two kind of states of data. Um, you can think of data, uh, data at rest and data in motion and data in motion uh, tends to remain in motion and data at rest tends to remain at rest. Um, and that actually seems to be the case, at least thus far, that's been the case. Um, data in motion um, wants to stay in motion. And you're advantaged by trying to keep it in motion. The more uh, the, the the more you try and slow it down, uh, the greater the cost and uh, and the less effect it has. So you have this inertia uh, from that perspective, um, and then you also have kind of the other side of data at rest is tends to stay at rest, um, and so you <laughs> use it a lot more. You, you you you're not going to use it as much. You're going to do uh, you're going to read from it, but even if you're training a model, it's still not going to be used as much as kind of in-flight data. 
this this is this is where I love how how deep you went with the math, right? Because data inertia is a factor in in your thinking on these things, and that it's definitely a component. Which which brings me to something that like uh, Bernard Golden and I went on and talked about this on, on when we were talking to him on Lady Shiny. Um, exchanges, co-resident data, like part of what you're describing with data at rest is, hey, I've got this data, it's live, it's active, we've got something going on. Other people than, than just the person creating it probably could get value. I could monetize that data, that data in motion. You can monetize the data at rest too, but the data in motion seems like super valuable information. I'm in flight, you know, I, you know, the airline owns that, that data or, or you know, GE or whoever, whoever owns that data. It's actually coming from potentially multiple sources, right? The in-flight people and the airline and the engines and, um, you know, whatever's going on. Is there a marketplace for additional edge compute applications in an airplane or some other edge, edge infrastructure? There are. Uh, I, I gave a. I gave a talk on this. Um, uh, I guess it would have been last year um, at uh, at Thing Monk uh, in London, and I was talking about uh, where the where the value of data is hiding in in IoT, and the the reality is. Yes, uh, there is value. The, the highest value comes from uh, merging these unique data sources together and, and garnering value out of them. Uh, the people that own the data generators um, and usually end up owning the data from them uh, are advantaged in being able to to leverage that for new things, but it doesn't prevent someone from combining multiple data sources and creating new and valuable data and insights from that. Um, it's, and it's going to become more and more common. Uh, the, the earliest companies that were making money out of abstract amounts of data um, from different sources uh, that I'm aware of at least uh, are the, uh, are the credit uh, the credit companies such as Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, uh, and the like? Mm. And so they've been leveraging externalized data and and really fusing together different data sources for uh, a very long time and making a great deal of money off of it. Um, later on, I watched as uh, uh, the weather company effectively did the same thing. They get people right. to voluntarily give them their data. And uh, that same effect that you're describing is why Facebook is free. Right, right. They're monetizing the, the user's data is very valuable in this case. Uh, I've heard similar things about um, the ride sharing companies like Lyft um, having, you know, what, the, what they know about individual people is remarkable. Um, and same with the cell phone providers and the, uh, right, they, they know a lot of information. It's a reason to be paranoid. Well, there was um, a story, there was a story that came out, uh, I believe I read it uh, today or yesterday that talks about uh, Uber announcing its credit card service. And you can now get an Uber credit card and uh, the highest, what I'll call cash back uh, or, uh, or percentage on their credit card was focused on restaurants. And people were trying to figure out why. And this article goes on to say the reason why they're making it so attractive for restaurants, and I believe like 4% was the, was the cash back rate for restaurants. <laughs> they are trying to take advantage of, uh, of Uber Eats. Uh, so you leverage Uber Eats. Uh, Uber knows who you are. They know the places you go when you use them. And they know the restaurants you eat at. And by being the credit card company, they know the food that you're purchasing at the restaurant right uh with that level right. with with that level of insight you can do amazing things that uh uh that you couldn't otherwise by being able to merge all of those different uh, streams of data so so that makes sense to me 
but those are those aren't real time applications, right? That's cloud integrations to me with with traditional uh, air quotes traditional uh, big data analytics and causality, right? That's that's it's amazing machine learning. Can that stuff? be translated into a, an infrastructure, you know, an edge hub where you're making split second decisions by sharing data right at, you know, right at the edge and then basically having a multi-tenant environment so that I could show up with an application that says, um, you know, I'm analyzing people's behavior in a restaurant and actually able to make real time responses based on information I've collected both from how they got there, but also, you know, video cameras or phone or air, you know, traffic, you know, internet, and, and this is going to sound super creepy, um, because of the amount of data and analytics that we can do, um, it is, you know, it, it's a different, a different mentality on how, how our lives are going to be treated, but it's also this tremendous market opportunity to provide real deep analytics around in the environment around you as you're encountering it. Um, I think, I think um, some of that is already being pioneered right now um, yeah. at casinos and theme parks. Right. So those are primary people are paying for that experience in that case. So it's, it's, they want it or adding to it. You throw in augmented reality and a, and a waiter or somebody, you know, a, a theme park worker wearing augmented reality. Um, and you could have, you know, one very, very low latency, but you could be selling all sorts of interesting upgraded experiences into that environment. Um, you could sell an people. experience. I, I can imagine someone in a costume having an augmented reality. Uh, uh, I'll call it a helmet. It could be glasses, mm -hmm. whatever, um, with the ability to um, greet a child by name. Um, that otherwise, you know, there wouldn't be a practical way for them to be aware. They could have lots and lots of information and insight as if they were, uh, as if they knew the child and they were old friends or right. something else. They could say, oh, you, they, yeah, they, I they, remember they seeing you learn. last year. Right. I remember seeing you last year. Uh, you just rode the, the wild roller coaster ride. How was that? That kind of insight is not, yeah. you know, it seems like science fiction, but today with what we have, it would be totally, totally within the realm of, of something you could do. Not even that hard to imagine. And those things drive back to very high compute intensity in the park, right? This is that the, the park becomes an edge infrastructure. Some analytics, some big data is going to be done. It's cloud resource and diversity way. Um, but a lot of that's going to be done in the cloud, or sorry, at the edge um, in those facilities. Right or down, right down in the you know the the block of the park. Um, yes. But it's probably not going to be done as much in the costume, right? In the in the. But maybe. Well, it, it, you you could you could certainly run a model in the costume, and you could send it the. Actually, I'll take that back. It could very well happen in the costume um, if we were willing to fast forward, say, five to seven years. And the reason would be 5G. Mm, okay. Uh, five, 5G would make it uh, uh, very easy um, to do that at an appropriate uh, density and, and latency and speed that you would need. Um, so that's, I think it's within the realm of, of possibility to see it even in the costume. Um, if, would you always do it in the costume? I think it depends on the application and what you're trying to achieve. I think there's appropriateness for doing things in the cloud. You talk about multi-tenant and data sharing. Uh, that's far more appropriate in a, in a shared cloud environment or in a shared uh, data source location, again, because of data gravity, uh, even sharing between those data sources and trying to combine and merge them they're more advantaged if this data sources are close to one another, whether you're going to try and run some kind of service to communicate between them or uh, whatever you're having to do to try and merge those, those uh, components of data together. They're advantaged right. if you're, if you're near them. Um, at the same time, uh, maybe you need absolute real time for whatever purposes, and then you're going to want to run the compute locally. 
Uh, that applies, by the way, another big area that's uh, being looked at uh, where latency um, will have mixed needs would be in uh, sports. Uh, at AWS, mm -hmm. there's a big demo where they were talking about uh, UFC fighting and things. But I think about things that are already instrumented and having more things happening, like uh, Formula E and uh, uh, I know they're going to do the electric car that. Formula One. Yeah, that's right. They're going to do it with regular Formula One as well. I'm certain, and you're going to see any other thing uh, along those lines. Any of these sports, you're going to see more and more sensors. You're going to see more and more things happen, and I could ultimately see. Uh, I could see some sports um, even having real-time processing happening on the athlete. Uh, one of the things that would come to mind, it would take some change, but I could see it happening in football. Uh, I could easily mm -hmm. see, uh, I could easily see coordination by a coach sending, uh, sending data to players um, in helmet. I could see that. I could see, I, uh, and I could see retrieving information on individual players. As <laughs> soon as it's, it's going to be very hard to tell a, a, a physical player from a virtual player um, in right. the amount of data and modeling and and AI potentially that's available for these players on field or from a coach or from a remote coach. And then the whole crowd, you know, the you know one of the we've we've talked uh, previously about stadium, you know, stadium data centers and, and processing capabilities at the stadium level, um, which makes total sense. Um, and I know Steven's, Steven's going to start giving us the stink eye for um, time because there's a, there's, a, there's a thing that we get right up to um, and maybe we need to save for a future one um, because now we're starting to talk about portability of of processing models and platforms um, you know because what what we're talking about is edge isn't going to be programmed in a different way than cloud we're gonna we're gonna have one platform you know, one set of platforms one set of development resources that's got to span this this incredibly diverse range right is that it I'm saying that like a statement you and I you and I go back a, a long long time that that credible to you? Uh, I I think so. I, I think that would be credible yeah. to me. We're we're at a point where uh, things are things are evolving very quickly, but I think their general direction is is pretty clear. I just think all of the implementation details and what happens uh, aren't entirely clear because we're still mm, finding yeah. new applications and approaches for a lot of these things. And so uh, until we've hit saturation of, of even what I would call broad use cases, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think we can kind of say that it's set in stone there. There's still too many, too many new use cases popping up too many businesses, companies, and things that are going to be uh, broadly affected by this by, uh, by both machine learning and by uh, IoT and all of the all of the data and implications that those bring. Do Do you think that there will be different? It will be a different expertise, like from a tools, platforms, programming capabilities. You know, dealing with an edge infrastructure is going to be significantly different than dealing with cloud infrastructures, or are we going to see a blending? Um, my guess is we will see a, we will see a blend where, um, edge infrastructure will be treated as, as extended clouds or, uh, or they'll be treated as, uh, fleets or something like that. Already today in the cloud, many of the approaches to managing, uh, uh, to managing devices uh, on the edge uh, are done with, uh, with shadow uh, environments or shadow devices or, uh, or the equivalent where you have, a, you have a thing that represents a device that's, uh, that's on the edge. So having edge servers that have the, the same thing is a likely paradigm, I would say, uh, that we'll see to manage them. You'll simply have a shadow device that 
uh, that's a virtual representation of that device that's out on the edge and we'll simply manipulate that and those manipulations will, will be reflected out on that edge device or edge devices uh, whether it be a server or something like that or it be you know a phone or a you know some kind of iot device whatever it happens to be well, I, I like the way you're explaining it right it's it the, the edge people are going to use the cloud to build every all the other infrastructure and where they need it they're going to be able to create simulated or phantom or shadow uh capabilities for that for that infrastructure and then sort of test it train it move it forward and then distribute it to the edge um yep. that, that sounds that that sounds like that that sounds like what you're saying um that is yeah um but then again all none of this is really built yet so <laughs> who knows Oh, there's golden earth, those, those darn hills. Uh. Well, I mean, some of it's built, right? I can already manage devices um, via right. these, these shadow models. That's already enabled across uh, all of the IoT solutions I've seen. They have that type okay. of capability. Um, you already have edge servers available um, from a green grass perspective uh, through Amazon. Um, so some of this may already be built but just not uh out there or maybe in the process of being built and we'll see soon i, I think that would be right. at least the first generation obviously we'll have multiple generations and they'll get more sophisticated the, the thing the thing that strikes me and, and we've talked about this in, in previous podcasts is that the from a scale perspective we need to get towards multi-tenant right we can't have uh, you know, in an airplane, six different uh, edge providers with their own dedicated infrastructure all running in that airplane, right? It just doesn't make sense. So the same is going to be with true with 5G towers, right? You can't have five or 10 or 20 vendors all maintaining their own infrastructure in that tower. It's going to end up being some type of shared model, um, which is very, which is a cloud-like model, um, I wouldn't call it cloud, but it's a it's a multi-tenant shared infrastructure model. Uh, well, so I would generally agree with that. I, I but okay. you're going to have, I mean, if we just talk at a minimum, if we ignore Sprint and T-Mobile, you're still going to have AT and T and Verizon providing 5G towers, and they're going to be mm -hmm. separate towers. Uh, so you have a level of redundant infrastructure from that perspective. Um, I could see having redundant infrastructure in some of these cases. I don't see having six vendors uh, uh, on on a plane, for example. But it's simply too costly. Um, right. It doesn't make sense. Multi tenancy, um, in my view, uh, in clouds already exists. Uh, that's the very nature of using an Amazon and Azure is that you're getting some degree of advantage by being in a generally multi-tenant environment even if you believe it's not multi-tenant uh, it actually still is multi-tenant um, right. it, it's it's how low in how deep in the stack do we go of things that are multi-tenant and, and does it even make sense or do we need it to be multi-tenant and i think there there are arguments where yes it absolutely should be multi-tenant it makes a lot of sense there are other cases where you absolutely would not want it to be multi-tenant. I get back to regulatory, trade secret, confidential information, governmental. Mm. Um, there, there's a broad regulatory. There's a broad swath of things where you know what. I don't see it being multi-tenant for potentially one to two more decades, at least. At least. Um, no, that's right. It, and then there are others where absolutely today it's why isn't this multi-tenant? Um, so I think it's I think it's case by case on what the demand for multi-tenant is, depending on on what what specific implementation we're talking about. Right. Well, to, to me, multi-tenant becomes an innovation need it, because if I'm doing edge, if I want to innovate at the edge, I I don't want to build, provision, manage infrastructure, edge infrastructure. It's it's prohibitive. So I need to be able to ride on somebody else, an AT&T, Verizon, tell, you know, some you know, 
I, it could be anybody. It could be municipalities who've built out that capacity so that I can be in all these edges um, without having to have to, you know, buy buy and put Dell servers in every field in Kansas uh, to manage a, manage crop rotation, right? Um, those are very, I mean, a very real infrastructure. That's what one of the reasons why Amazon, you know, correctly says they they drive innovation very effectively because a whole bunch of people never had to buy a server in order to to build a you know a unicorn application. Um, and with and Dave, you you and I, I love talking to you. Um, we've gone very deep, uh, which I love. We've also gone incredibly broad. Um, but that means we're also out of time. So we're gonna have to sort of hold, maybe plan a, another conversation and dig deeper. Next time somebody uh, can't explain data gravity, we'll look you back up and say, all right, Dave, fix it. Tell us what's right. That sounds great. I enjoyed it. So Dave, I'll just jump in here to close up. Uh, if anyone's interested in uh, following you or you know, I assume you're on Twitter, maybe a blog. Can you just kind of let us know what that, your contact information? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's just my last name, at M-C-C-R-O-R-Y. And my blog is blog.mccrory, same spelling as before, uh, dot M-E. Oh, well, that's easy. So, um, Dave, thank you again, Rob. Uh, I, I think that was... That was a lot of content you went through. It was really good. <laughs> it was a lot. And I also yeah, like David, how... David's smart. He makes it easy to talk, talk super deep. <laughs> but I also like it. it gives us a different viewpoint of what we've been talking about. And, uh, you know, one of the great things in this podcast is we keep getting people that say things and have different ideas. So hopefully our listeners are uh, enjoying these people. Well, thanks to both of you. And uh, I am sure in the next couple of months we'll be recording an, another podcast as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.